Bueno, vamos a, vamos a continuar con, con la sesión de esta tarde. Para los que estáis eh, online, eh, pues también vamos a empezar, porque empezamos también online. Esto es lo bueno que tiene, que estamos en directo. Bien, eh, vamos a cambiar a, a, al inglés, para, porque Jennifer eh, pues, habla inglés, así que vamos al inglés. So, um, first of all, thank you, Jennifer, to, to stay with us today. And let me introduce just a, a little uh, about Jennifer. Jennifer, I have to read because it's a very long <laughs> title, so I have to read. So, Jennifer is a director of a strategic uh, project in the TC8, uh, T TCD, sorry, TCD is the Trinity College of Dublin. Uh, Center of Digital Humanities, and uh, currently is co-director of the TCD Center for Digital Humanities, and uh, is director of DARIA as well, that DARIA is the infrastructure that I was talking about in my first, uh, in my first uh, speaking. So uh, now I'm, I'm going to give the, the word to Jennifer, And Jennifer is going to talk uh, about uh, Daria as an infrastructure for digital humanities, digital tools, search data, and know-how dissemination. I hope that this uh, session uh, will be of interest for all of you. And um, just uh, all of you. Yes, thank you. All right. Okay, so the f I, I, I like to be difficult. So the first thing is, can you hear me if I stand? Can you hear me okay? Can make a microphone? Okay. So first thing is I have to stand up. The second thing is my slides are over there and I'm over here, which kind of freaks me out. Um, but we'll, we'll find a way to work with that. Gosh, that is very... I'm echoing. I'll try. I need just the right space. Okay. Remember that you have the camera. And I have the camera. Yeah, yeah true. <laughs> this is a very... You're a very yeah, difficult this a, this venue. Is a, this is the most important one. You should have sent me, you know, all of these directions. You need to stand and you need to look and get your good side. Okay. Anyway, so I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much to um, Saba for inviting me and for you to uh, put up with my, uh, my, my English for uh, about an hour and a half. And I hope you'll have questions as well. This will be very different from the last session you had because this is... I'm going to oh, sorry. I'm going to change this. Turn that one off. Okay, you can still hear me, yeah? Okay, so this will be very different from the last session you've had because what I'm gonna talk about is a little bit of digital humanities, a little bit of humanities, a little bit of research policy, a little bit of EU funding, a little bit of open science. I just put it all in there because that's sort of the way uh, it all makes sense to me. So, let's start off. So. The key thing I'm going to talk about is research infrastructure. Now, what is infrastructure? And what is research infrastructure? A lot of people, I'm just too loud. I really am just too loud. A lot of people, when they think of research infrastructure, will think of that middle picture, like roads, bridges. Not research infrastructure, but just infrastructure. And the whole idea of building infrastructure for research, I think, suffers still from this image, which dogs us. Because it makes people think that if you're going to build infrastructure, you have to dig a very big hole in the ground, put a lot of concrete there, and chase atoms around in circles. We don't do that in the humanities. And for a long time, there was a misconception that because we didn't do that, we didn't need infrastructure. And certainly we didn't need to be funded to build infrastructure. But now what we're finding is definitions of infrastructure, so that fundamental level that we all need to do our research, that's actually changing. So it might be that infrastructure is really where people come together and share knowledge. And you know, the two ideas that I'm gonna play with a little bit, I won't talk so much today about knowledge spaces, I will talk a little bit about knowledge infrastructure, but I will talk a bit about marketplaces. Because the whole idea of what we work with, how we work, is much more about exchanging ideas and sharing them back and forth than it is about having access to a particular very expensive instrument that's going to do a very expensive sort of test on an expensive sort of thing. So moving on from this, let's see, sorry, I have to be very specific about how I click. So why do we want it though? So if it is largely about 
chasing atoms around in circles or getting radio frequencies from lots and lots of dishes. Um, the things that building and using shared infrastructure that, that they can do for us, that they can make our research better, easier, stronger, more integrated. So one of the things that really that this does, when we do this at a European level, is that we end up with access to networks and data and knowledge. So the things we need to do our work are easier to get. That means that our work is more efficient and potentially more insightful. And that's really what we all want. It also enhances pathways for visibility, reuse, and impact. I'll come back to this a little bit, but we all know that a lot of humanities research, if it's published as an article, it may not get read. If it is released as a digital um, uh, project, as, a, as an edition, for example, it may not get used. If it's released as a data set, it may not get reused. This is a lot actually about how we signpost what we've done, but it's also about the way we work. We have a tendency to put a lot of our minds into the way we organize data. And that actually is a barrier to reuse, but it's also a strength of our work. And the goal of infrastructure is not to change what we do in any kind of negative way, but it's about to enhance what we do. And I'll come back to that definition in a minute. So other things that we gain by building infrastructure. Well, better alignment with shared standards and policies. So for example, libraries, which you could consider a research infrastructure for the humanities, are very good with standards. You have the MARC standards for the, the metadata, or archives have EAD. So we can see how these sorts of standards can become a part of what we do. TEI would be another one. And we can also integrate with policy frameworks. So I don't know how much you know about open science. I'll talk about that a bit later as well. But this is a, a kind of an emerging, um, I don't even quite know what to call it. It might be a movement. It might be a set of restrictions. It might be a set of values. But it is certainly one that the European Commission thinks we should all be bought into. So it's a thing to be aware of, and that infrastructure can enable us to be better able to access and use. Infrastructure also increases the opportunities for seeking collaborative funding. I hate to say it. I hate to talk about money. But alas, that's where I am in my career now. I do talk about money. And it's important sometimes for us to have that access because money is jobs, it's people, it's researchers, it's funding, it's data, it's all of those things. It's not money for money's sake. It's money for the things that we need to do research. I know lots of people who will say, oh, I need to do my research as a pencil and time. Actually, then they email you and say, I found this in this database. It's like, well, where'd you get the email and where'd you get the database? That wasn't done with a pencil. So we do need funding, we do need to be aware of that. And finally, again, I was talking about reusability. Actually, the sustainability is the other side of that. So when we're done with something and we move on to the next thing, what happens to all that investment? How does the next person find it? How does the next person take it on? So these are all things that are goods about research infrastructure, things that it does, that it facilitates, but it's also things that you can use as researchers, as scholars, and that knowing what's in the research environment can actually help you access those better. Now, you may notice I haven't actually defined research infrastructure yet, giving you lots of different ideas and lots of different things. And that's not actually just me. Um, <laughs> I was so frustrated by the fact that I couldn't define research infrastructure that I took seven definitions of research infrastructure. And I took them and I took them apart. And they come from different places, and that's part of the problem, is that building research infrastructure requires different people to come together from different perspectives to build something that is, that is useful to a broad base of people. So I found these seven definitions from library science, from information science, from US and EU policy circles, from training, from an implementation perspective, and also from a cultural theory perspective. And I found very little consensus. So it seems to me that infrastructure is like the blind men and the elephant. I don't know if you know this image, but if you imagine a bunch of blind men around an elephant, one of them's gonna feel the leg and say an elephant is like a tree trunk, and one's gonna feel the tail and say an elephant's like a rope. Infrastructure is exactly like that. So I won't bore you with the seven definitions, although if you want them, just email me. I'd be very happy to share them with you because it's quite interesting. But what I will show you is what comes out. Okay, so things that infrastructures have. Deep breath. 
Facilities, resources, human resources, services, equipment, instruments, collections, archives, databases, structured information systems, grid, computing, software, middleware, information expertise, standards, policies, tools, knowledge, data, people, a wide user base, standardized paths, and protocols. Lots of stuff. And in some ways, this is really good because this means that they're not saying buildings, concrete. They're actually recognizing that the level we need to support research is much more varied, is much wider, much more heterogeneous than the old definitions, the roads, the bridges definitions actually, actually shows. And actually what's interesting is a lot of the definitions actually read just like this. You will say, they'll say, research infrastructures have da -da 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 -da, and they have all these commas, it's just a list of things. It's like the shopping list version of research infrastructure. So, another list for you. Okay. All right. So what are they? Well, here's some of the characteristics they may have. Deep breath again. Single-sided, distributed, or virtual, technology-based, shared, unbounded, heterogeneous, open and evolving, complex agglomerations, diverse, unique, shared broadly for specific scholarly purposes, socio-technical systems, and installed base of diverse information technology capabilities, user operations, design communities, a more specific than a network, but more general than a tool. So again, a lot of desire to see a lot of things in the definition, but that isn't really always useful if you're trying to say, well, how do I think about the infrastructure that I need? How do I think about the infrastructure that a research community will need? It doesn't make it easy. So then, the things that they do. They mediate. They allow things, people, and signs to travel across space. I love that one. It's like, what? Um, they support research. Well, that seems obvious. And they allow individuals to achieve beyond their capacity to know, to do, and to see. Well, that's good too. But my favorite definition of what an infrastructure does is that it gets below the level of the work. So, what does this mean? So, the, the actual meaning of that. So, this is actually Edwards, Jackson, Bowker, Knoble. If you really want to know, it's a great article. It's a few years old now. It's a great article about infrastructure. And their idea is that to be infrastructure, it has to operate without saying how work gets done or exactly how information gets processed. So it says, most systems that attempt to force conformity to a particular conception of work processes, e.g. Lotus Notes. I don't, none, do any of you remember or have you ever worked with Lotus Notes? You probably remember Lotus Notes, so yeah, you would, but you know, we're the old folks here. Lotus Notes was terrible. I remember, just my, my, my husband worked in an office where they had Lotus Notes. He'd come home and he'd like, oh my God because what it did was it made you use their rules. How often have you found yourself trying to use one of these great newfangled digital research tools and said, I can't use this because I have to learn the tool rather than having the tool be responsive to what I do. Now that tool may be useful to you, but infrastructure will support you the way you want to work. It doesn't change the way you work, it just allows you to work more efficiently. So the example that they give as an infrastructure is email. You can write an email, it's fairly straightforward to figure out how it does, and it's quite variable. You can write an email to your mother, you can write an email to your director, you can write an email to your project partner. And you can do these different things, you can have these different roles that you play, push forward different parts of your life by using the same tool. That's where the infrastructure gets below the level of the work you want to do. And that, for me, is where infrastructure should be. Now, again, back to this question of whether humanists need digital research infrastructure. Now, we know we need research infrastructure. We know we need the internet. We know we need uh, a library. Or we know we need access to a virtual library. Um, but when people say, ah, you know, humanists, you don't really need digital research infrastructure. Well, it's interesting to go back and realize that really the first examples of research infrastructures were libraries, and that's where we live. So never let anyone tell you that you're late to the infrastructure party. You know, just say, look, it started with us guys, okay? So just cool off and back off. Um, so these knowledge infrastructures, and we still have them, but what we're starting to see is needs for different things, and I'm gonna work through what I mean by that in a second. But before I do, I think one of the main things is that we are all digital now. As I was saying, people who will say I only need a pencil, but then go and use email, databases, and various other things. Um, and the, the phrase I like to use is from humanities at scale to humanities in the long tail. 
So if you're doing the big data-driven, uh, you know, interrogation with tools and you're kind of, you're programming, you're using Python, you've got your IPython libraries out there, whatever they're calling that, your Jupyter Notebooks, um, you know, then you're doing, a, you're doing humanities a certain way, using a certain methodology. But you're still gonna be digital if you're just a person who works with books, who reads, and then writes. Because, for example, the way we publish now, the industry is digital. So we're all going to hit some aspect of digitality. The way we communicate is digital. So there's going to be digitality in your work anywhere. And that's where I would say, I don't know if you know this image of the long tail. So it's about, you know, there's going to be people who are very intensively using technology, but then there's going to be a lot more people who are much less intensively looking at technology. And they need digital infrastructure too. Which is why in Daria, we're actually moving away from the term infrastructure for the digital humanities and using more digital infrastructure for the humanities. Because some people will say, I am a digital humanist. And other people will say, oh, no, 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 that's not me. And really, many times the best digital work isn't done by people who identify as digital humanists. Very often it's done by people who um, see themselves as historians or literary scholars, but happen to do a little Python on the side. So I think it's important to remember that, and it's also remember, important to remember that there is this whole thing about the digital black box. Because the digitality, it has certain affordances, it allows things, but it hides other things. So back in my day, when I was doing my thesis, if I was quoting Foucault, because I'm from that critical theory era, that mad critical theory era, um, if I quoted Foucault without reading Foucault, somebody would take me down. Be like, oh, but don't you remember on page 428 where he said, um, oftentimes people are encouraged to use digital tools without understanding what they do and what they don't do. And you can't always use a digital tool or an environment unless you know what it can't do. So if you ask it this kind of question, if you expect this kind of response, if you're looking for it to deliver in a certain way, you're moving into a black box. And unless you have a, at least a rough idea of what's happening in the black box, um, you're going to be exposed as a scholar because you won't really know where your methodology is based. So I like this quote about how um, digital methods can be imposed upon researchers whose needs in terms of information processing are often not, to ex not explained too concretely. I have a colleague. Um, this, is, this is Jane. Salvador will know Jane. So I have a colleague who um, works on this set of manuscripts uh, called the 1641 Depositions. This is hot stuff in Ireland. I know, it's from 1641, but um, so much so that they were not allowed to be published for a very long time because while Ireland, which is split, while there were still these kind of border problems and, and terrorism and the troubles, as we call it, um, there was a fear that if these documents were released that um, they would cause up uprisings or strife. Anyway. So Jane is one of the premier scholars of this set of documents. And what's interesting is um, she did do a digital edition, and she did a very good digital edition of them. And then one day she said to me, oh, I'm very excited. I'm going to finally use the 1641 depositions, the digital edition, as it was meant to be used. I'm looking for widows. And she came back to me a day or two later, and she says, I was very disappointed. I knew, I found 243 widows. I can't remember exactly how many. And I know there's more. So I went back and looked. And the search query missed half of the widows because they'd remarried. And I said, well, they weren't widows anymore if they'd remarried, were they? She said, yes, but they were widows. So again, it was this question of, her question made perfect sense to her as a historian. But the system said, okay, we're looking for pattern match to the word widow, widow status as widow. Status is widow, status is not widow. So this is where I think it's really important to make sure that an infrastructure supports methodologies, but it supports them as people want to use them rather than imposing them. Again, below the level of the work, not imposing on it. Now, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> so going back to this question of um, whether or not we need digital infrastructure, I mentioned I thought different things were happening, and I think one of the things we see happening that's causing the need for new kinds of infrastructure, not saying we don't need the old ones anymore, but saying actually we need new ones, 
is a, what I would see as a gradual bifurcation, a sort of a splitting between the people who keep the sources, librarians, archivists, and the people who facilitate the activity. Now those were always the same before, but here's, let's go back in time a little bit and look at what that meant. So here's my two poster children. So I'm not, I'm not a historian by training. I'm a, I'm a literary scholar by training. But for some reason, fate has had it that I work mostly with historians. So my examples are either from German literature or from, from history. This is one from history. So the guy on the left there, that's Leopold von Ranke. Any historians here? No historians? OK, a sort of a semi-historian. You know, may know von Ranke. He was one of the, the fathers of historiography. He wrote a lot about what history should be like. His claim to fame was to say that the historian should write history as it actually was. He was very modest. You know, he felt that you could just write history and recreate it. No problem. The second guy I met much later in my life, this is Antonio Panizzi. His kind of lead claim to fame, the 91 rules to be observed in preparing and entering titles. His claim to fame was denying Thomas Carlyle, the famous historian, access to uncatalogued materials. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever worked in an old library with ancient collections, like we have at my institution, you've met this guy. This is the guy who says, you cannot bring your laptop into the manuscript room because the keys are too loud. Or, you cannot see that manuscript today because it's too humid. These are the people, and you know, I, I say that slightly in jest, but at the same time, there's a real reason for that. But it does put the goals of these two kind of types of people, we have our, our kind of our, our poster children as it was, but these two types of people will come into conflict because the historian is looking for the veracity, the completeness, the accessibility, the comprehensibility of the sources because what they want to do is pull them together, verify them, and create from them the required record of the fleeting and transitory events of the past. So this is from Ranke. This is how it actually was. By writing it, by pulling it together, by reading the different sources, I can actually hold it in my hands as if the event is somehow mine. Um, the information specialist is really interested in provenance. Where did it come from? Completeness and material condition of the sources. Um, preservation, usability over the long term. There's a conflict here and it never used to be a problem. So it used to be that your historian would be there and saying, okay, I'm going in and I'm going to see this stuff. When you pass through the door of one of these temples of learning, you find yourself in a certain culture and you can work according to that culture. In the digital, suddenly you're mixing the cultures. So if I'm a, a historian working on transnational questions, you know, I may want to say, take some things that are library holdings and mix them with some things that are archival holdings with other things that are from a museum. But they're described in different, I mean, they're different institutions, which are already going to have their differences. But they're also going to be described in different ways. They're going to have different standards in those communities. So suddenly, the desires that access to sources bring in the historian actually cause a need for a different kind of infrastructure. And it's just different, and sometimes quite different, from the, the traditional values and the traditional strengths of museums, libraries, and archives. So this is what gets us into a problem and a need for new kinds of infrastructure. Because the old values and the new get balanced. Uh, when I was building my first research infrastructure, you never forget your first research infrastructure, um, we used to ask museums, libraries, and archives if they would let us share their metadata. And they'd be like, oh, no, 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 I don't trust you. How, are we, how am I going to know what you're going to do with it? I'm like, well, sort of. I mean, it's metadata. Uh, you know, what am I gonna, how am I going to cause harm with metadata? But there is a real sense that there's um, a conservatism there. And not only is it a conservatism, because again, remember, these are institutions that are there to protect the record. Of course they're going to be conservative. Protection is not a risky thing. Um, but there is a sense that there's a need to, to ensure that these risks are not taken overly. And there's also the problem that the digital is causing difficulties in these hierarchies. So it used to be that probably your lead archivist was the person who would know what was in the collections, know where to find them, and be able to say to you, yes, you can use them. Nowadays, we find there's different people. You would still have an archivist who would know 
where something was, what was in this, the collections. But you're probably going to have somebody who's the technical support person who knows how to get it out. So you say, well, you know, do you have an API? And they say, I, I don't know. Can you do a data dump? Well, I don't know. So those two bits of knowledge are now in different heads. And they don't always talk the same language. Then the third bit of knowledge that you need, that, that kind of the ability to say yes, the ability to kind of say, this is what our institution is dedicated to. This is what we can promote. That's often a third person now. That's often sort of the bureaucrat's role. So the, that has sort of split as well. And that's a difficult thing when you're trying to do these crazy new things and say, oh, we want to federate all this information so people can you know, do this crazy stuff with. And they just say, you know what? We don't know if you're going to be around in 100 years, but we are. So I think maybe not. Um, but those institutions as well are struggling to keep their um, keep up with the new and the old. So my library has not received huge amounts of new investment in order to support their digital activities. Some, maybe, but not a lot. And yet, the cataloging is the same. The, the, that we still have things that are not, that need to be preserved, conserved, cataloged, presented, described. So the old the old work is still there, but the new work is there as well. So there is the sense that, you know, we're still looking at kilometers per year. And the computer scientists just say, well, how many gigabytes is that? How many petabytes is that? And they're like, I don't know, I can tell you what it is in kilometers. Um, so there is this sort of sense that there's a difficulty keeping up. Even the best librarians who want to do more and want to support more are having a difficulty balancing that with the resource needs for all the stuff that needs to get done. There's also the question of these new methodologies. So if you want to do something like distant reading, well, how does a librarian approach that? Librarians know how to facilitate reading. They find you the book, they give you the book, they let you take it home. Now you want a distant read. Well, as we're seeing even now in the European Parliament, the discussion around the legal aspects of text and data mining are very contentious. So where do libraries play a role in that? Um, and also, of course, what I call the, the high upfront investment mentality. When something comes into a library, it has to be described. You have to create a metadata record. And that actually takes time. And it takes expertise. So you need the people who can do that. That's very hard. And then I already mentioned the idea of federated aspects of research, for example, for transnational history, which make it all that much more complicated. So the archive is, is struggling a bit. Um, and at this point, I have to be quite honest, because I still have not told you what research infrastructure is. So I'm going to attempt. I told you it gets below the level of the work. I told you some of the things, some of the values of infrastructure. And I've told you how I think digital libraries are actually something different from what I'm talking about, which is more of a methodological support, more of a researcher-driven definition of infrastructure. So wait for it. I'm getting there. Just wanted to let you know I hadn't forgotten. Now, so. One of the things I've been looking at is, well, how do we define this? Because one of my jobs over the summer is to write a strategic plan for the Daria Eric, for this great 17-member European research infrastructure. So I better figure out what it is. So one of the things I did one or two years ago is I started thinking about, well, what is it not? And one of the things I realized is that there are a lot of practices in research infrastructure development. Not all of them get you below the level of the work. And I started sort of thinking about, well, what sorts of things do you develop that maybe aren't infrastructure or that could be infrastructure? What are the kinds of practices you need to develop infrastructures? So for example, I was looking at scale and complexity. So a diversity of users. Remember, to get below the level of the work, I mean, you can do that for one person, but that's not quite enough. That's one person's tool. And one person's tool might get below the level of their work but it might not get below the level of anyone. So that doesn't really tick the box for that. Using diverse resources and diverse methods. Actually coming through multiple research phases. So not just being about that one intervention, that one place, which actually I think is where humanists like technology the most. They like the tool that does the thing that fits into their instrument really well. Um, but for example, things that take data into knowledge, that federate, integrate, assimilate, and communicate. And I think things that don't actually have this element of, of scale and complexity actually might be more of a tool that are limited in their ability to be used. So I wouldn't necessarily call those a research infrastructure, although they may be part of one. And then I was thinking about the interoperability, the sustainability. 
and things that use standards that actually tap into these discussions of how we manage data, persistent identifiers that really are actually looking to be there for the long term, but also looking to be open, recognizing that people are going to want to do different things with this. So things that are evolving and involving, as we say, and things that are open. Now, things that are closed environment, again, can be actually quite useful for groups of people. But I would kind of say, actually, that sounds more like a research project. So one that actually serves a group of people, maybe serves a community, but not necessarily getting below the level of the work on a broad scale. And then finally, I was thinking about um, the idea that some things are just not built for research. Um, there are some wonderful projects out there that are designed, I mean, I think, for example, of Europeana. I have a huge respect for what Europeana does. They have managed to federate so many objects from, culture, from very diverse cultural heritage institutions. But their original metadata core set is very thin. It had 10 fields at the beginning. And some of those are actually wrong because different countries interpreted them differently. So if you really want to dig into it and really want to do research, Europeana will frustrate you in most cases. I know they're getting better and they have a new data model, so it's moving in a good direction. But the type of data, the granularity, um, also the baseline of expertise expected. You know, if you are working into research, you need to be able to get to dig into things. You need to know where things are coming from. You need to be able to trace them back. And that may not be supported. So it might be for teaching. It might be for public audience. And this has a research limitation. So some of the things that we're looking for is the infrastructure would be big, would be open, be durable, and fit to a broad purpose. So we're getting close to a definition. The next thing I started looking at was, are there different types of research infrastructure? Because I kept thinking, well, there are lots of things out there, but they're very different. So I began looking at, and this, you can ignore the diagram. The diagram is really trying to do is show you that I think there's different intensities of activities in different kinds of things that would be called a research infrastructure. So for example, if you're looking at um, you know, software tools and services, so EGI or Géant, these are the big European infrastructures that provide the backbone of um, internet connectivity for higher education across Europe. They're definitely infrastructure, but they are so far below the level of the work. They're not specific to the arts and humanities. So they're really way down there. Then you have standard organizations like ISO or even the TEI. So ISO would be kind of down here. The fact that we say, you know, Spain is ES and Germany is DE. So that we all understand what country we're talking about in two letters. You know, again, very basic. It sets standards. It brings people together. It's a, it's a fantastic supporting community. But it's not quite what I'm talking about. Then you have research centers in my institution. I mean, we have a center for digital humanities. And we do a lot of these things. We have data, we have a space, but we're very local. So again, it has scale within the institution, but not scale beyond that. And then, of course, we have these libraries, museums, archives, the sort of the knowledge infrastructures that gather information and preserve it. And then we have this kind of this other one, this sort of research infrastructure, this kind of European-wide, methodological, researcher-driven style infrastructure. And that's really, that's the one I'm trying to dig into. That's the one that actually is moderately intense across these various areas. So that's where we're looking to have a bit more knowledge by the end of this. Okay, where, where are you going here now? Right, 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 right. Oh, there. So again, if we think about those types I've just talked about, the colorful things on the one side. And then also I started thinking about the capacities. So in an infrastructure, you're largely going to find a mix of tacit and explicit knowledge. You're going to find things that are published, and then you're going to have things that you want to go ask somebody about. And that's going to be a balance you'll find. This is something we find very strongly in like libraries, museums, and archives. Oftentimes, you just have to ask the archivist because nobody's ever written it down but they know what it is. So this mix between the tacit and the explicit, I think, is important as a capacity. Um, the networks and the communities, the fact that they bring people together, I think is also very important. Um, software and services. So you will have that idea of the tools embedded into the infrastructure and data as well. Generally, there will be some kind of research data collections that are associated with a, with a large scale infrastructure. There may be labs and instruments. There are questions about the difference between a digital humanities center and a digital humanities lab. We can, we can argue about that at length if you like, um, or, or we can agree about it vociferously. Um, but again, what does it mean to have space? What does it mean to have instruments? 
Uh, I have specific ideas about instruments in the humanities as well, but let's not go there. That's a different presentation. And finally, there may be facilities, physical facilities where you can find the things you need. So if we take these capacities and these types and we try and map them to each other, as I said, there's different intensities in the relationship, and some will have more than others. But we still need to dig into this question of this sort of bottom, this very um, middle-level intensity, but across areas, um, which is how I would um, uh, uh, define what we do in Daria. So now we're going to have a short historical interlude, because why not? Um, the reason why we're having a short historical interlude is because I think to understand what Daria really is, where we've come from, how we organize ourselves, what we do, and indeed how you can make best use of us, how you can get to know us and get to work with us, um, you need to know where we came from and the moment we came from and the drivers that underpin what we do, like being able to click exactly on there. So we take you back to 2006 the good old days for research infrastructure. 2006, you probably never knew this. Next time you're at a quiz, you know, or a radio call-in show has a question and they say, what was the great moment for research infrastructure? You can call in and say, 2006. Why 2006? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm an infrastructure geek. Um, there's two publications that came out in 2006 that really, for me, consolidated the move that we see now, the sort of infrastructural turn in humanities research. The first of these is the Our Cultural Commonwealth publication. The second of these is the S3 Roadmap. Let me tell you a bit about those. So the US, as they will, started talking about infrastructures before we did. So Our Cultural Commonwealth was a follow-on report to something known as the Atkins Report. The Atkins Report was saying, if the United States is going to continue to compete and to be competitive as a research superpower, we need infrastructure. And this is what it should look like. And then John Unsworth, whose name many of you may know, um, said, wait, 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 wait. You're talking about things with blinky lights and lots of concrete and, you know, you're talking about bricks and mortar. We need to pull this back and somebody needs to express the needs of the arts and humanities. And that's what this this really excellent document did in 2006. And what I think is really interesting is that the goals that he set for us then as a community are still pretty relevant. So he talks about characteristics, accessible as a public good, sustainable, interoperable, collaborative, and supporting experimentation. A slightly different list from mine, but not a million miles from it. But if you look at the recommendations, invest in cyber infrastructure for the humanities and social sciences as a matter of strategic priority. Well, that's good. We like that. Develop public and institutional policies that foster openness and access. Europe is getting to that now, 12 years later. Um, promote cooperation between public and private sectors. We're not there yet. We should be, but we're not there yet. Cultivate leadership in support of cyber infrastructure from within the humanities and social sciences. Maybe. Encourage digital scholarship. What does that mean? Maybe. Um, certainly there's been incentives towards digital scholarship, but does that mean that there's been a, an encouragement of it? And, and why? I mean, not for its own sake, but what is it supposed to do? And this is another challenge we have. Establish national centers to support scholarship that contributes to and exploits cyber infrastructure. That's actually very much the, um, the Claren model. Any of you know anything about Claren? So Claren is another one of these EU infrastructures, but specifically for linguistic resources. And they have national centers pointing into a central organizing node. It's a bit different from us. Um, so that kind of is starting to happen. Develop and maintain open standards and robust tools. I think there's a lot of lip service to that, but less use of them. And finally, create extensive and reusable digital collections. Not there yet. Not there yet. We're creating perhaps extensive collections, but whether they're reusable, I'm not sure. So it's really interesting to see that what Unsworth was calling for in 2006 is still really what we need. It's still the baseline that we're looking for as digital scholars, or indeed as humanists of any sort. So then, then we can look a little bit at the S3 roadmap. Now, the S3 roadmap. So 2006, before 2006, you probably knew about the framework programs and then Horizon 2020, so this framework one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then there was Horizon 2020, 
And if anyone, again, another great thing for the pub quiz or the radio call-in show, you know, framework seven, horizon 2020, horizon Europe, because after seven comes 2020 and after 2020 comes Europe, I, I don't know. They just decided to stop counting. So before 2006, it was a very strange situation in infrastructure. I remember the Heidegger archive. No, yeah, they were an archive. They used to say, oh yeah, we have this money to bring people in. If you want to study Heidegger, just let us know and we'll, we'll give you a stipend. You can come study for free. It was like, like drug pushers, you know, saying, hey, we got money. Come study Heidegger. It's like, woo. Um, it was very strange and very, um, you didn't know why Heidegger was more important than anyone else. And the answer is because the Heidegger archive actually knew to apply for this particular money. They figured out that there would be a need to, to support the humanities as well and that they could make as good a case as anybody. So in 2006, the European Commission said, okay, we got to fix this. We got to figure out what really is important because Heidegger is no more or less important than anyone else. So what they did was they created a roadmap and they created a roadmap across the disciplines with key roadmap infrastructures that they said Europe needs to build these. Now, Daria was on that 2006 roadmap, um, as was Claren, which I just mentioned, as was Eros, the European Research Observatory for the Humanities, and actually it's probably another essay, I think it's Humanities and Social Sciences, or was just, I think it was actually just Humanities. Ever heard of Eros? No? I wonder why, because it never got launched. It was on the roadmap and quickly came off the roadmap. Because once you were on the roadmap, then the work started. So first thing you did was you had this preparatory phase grant. And then you had to figure out, what are we on about? Then you had a transition phase. And in the transition phase, you had to sell yourself to the national ministries. So this is what an ERIC is, is what we were doing in 2011 to 2013. We were working towards the foundation of the Daria Eric. Then, after a while as an Eric, we became a landmark. Then, in 2019, next year, this is why I'm doing the strategic plan, we will be in actually what's called full operational phase. So, that is where we're at. And the ESFRI roadmap, again, across the disciplines, across the areas, um, the European Spallation Source with their 1 billion euro budget per year, they're on there. The European Social Survey, SHARE for aging, they're all on this roadmap. So there's really a sense of, and there's a process for getting on the roadmap. In fact, the um, European Holocaust research infrastructure was just brought into the roadmap literally in the last couple of weeks. So they will now have the chance to build themselves up as an Eric. But you need to meet Eric. This is my friend Eric. No, that's not Eric. That is Eric. Wait, I'll show you Eric. Where is Eric? Where is the real Eric? Come on, we don't want people, we want policy documents. Because that's the kind of person I am. Oh, that's terrible. Come on, come on. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, so an ERIC is a European Research Infrastructure Consortium. So after 2006, that great year, we all started building these preparatory phase projects. And then we said, wait, now hold on. We're building stuff, but we're pan-European. So how are we going to have a, a, a kind of an organization that is European, but has to be somewhere? And they said, oh, uh, let us think about that. And they came back and they said, here, you can be an Eric. So this is a brand new legal instrument. This is a brand new form of institution, of organization that they created just for us. Just what we wanted for our birthdays. And what you have to do to become an Eric is you go around every country, and not to your researchers, not to your friends, but to their bosses. So you go either to the funding agency or to the Ministry for Education and Research, and you say, your country really wants to be a member, don't they? I mean, how could you possibly be left out? And by that process, you acquire commitments at the national level, at the policy level, for the country to be a member. And then below that, there is also a level at which you have the organizer who knows the field, who brings the people together, who brings the activities together. And there's a really interesting twist in this tale for Daria, which I'll tell you about as soon as I find my pointer again. So I'll tell you a little bit about why Daria is different from some of the other Eric's. Because again, we didn't want 
just as we didn't want to build a digital library, we didn't want to build the same thing that everybody else had because we knew arts and humanities is huge. I mean, the number of disciplines, practices, the kinds of data, they were just going to be very different. So we have a slightly different role. So these are, these are the first six ERICs to be approved, um, largely for biosciences, um, social science data, uh, linguistics, there's Claren there as well, they're, they're in one of the first six. Um, and when we came in, and I, I wasn't a part of this phase, but looking at it, I realized that there's these theories of organization, where you can have an organization that's a hierarchy, you have an organization that's a marketplace. And this is where we come back to this idea of the marketplace. And I really think that Daria functions well for its community. And mind you, as I mentioned, Eros never launched. Eros was supposed to be the real, quote unquote, infrastructure for the arts and humanities, because they didn't have the digital bit. But arts and humanities don't agree about anything. They're not a thing. But they can agree about, they're all impacted by the digital. So that makes it easier for us in some ways. And also, I don't know if you remember a project called Bamboo. I'll, make a, I'll tell you, I have a reference to Bamboo later. Bamboo was the Mellon Foundation funded response to our cultural commonwealth. And Mellon was just saying, right, we're going to have the ultimate infrastructure for arts and humanities. And it was very top down. I went to one of their consultation meetings. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we already know what we're going to do. But we're just having consultation meetings so people can hear about it. I mean, it was really top down. So Eris was too diverse. Bamboo was too top down. But we had this marketplace idea. And it really has worked well. So if you look at this, Daria's funding model, strangely enough, is 90% in kind and 10% cash. And that 10% cash is linked to GDP. So a very large country with a very strong economy, Germany, France, Netherlands, will have a much higher contribution than a smaller country. You know, Malta's contribution is very small in cash. Uh, Slovenia's contribution is very small in cash. Cyprus's contribution is very small in cash. But you still have this idea of the in-kind. And the idea that the countries had to give back in, that this was really like a, a, a pot, and that everyone put into the pot, not just cash, but also what was going on nationally. So I'll give you an example. Um, the French national, um, they have a, a wonderful unit for developing um, uh, supports for scholarship. One of the things that they put a lot of time into supporting is a, um, a digital repository for scholarship uh, called HAL. HAL can be used by anyone, and part of the reason is because they count that against their in-kind contribution to Daria, and that allows them to make the case for opening it up internationally. So these kinds of things are really beneficial, and they're going to become more important going into the future, which I'll, again, come to in a minute. The other thing is, thinking about the number of signatories, most of the early group of ERICs had a relatively small number of signatories. Five for Ekrin, five for Cher, six for Atris, nine for Claren. BBMRI had a few more. And European Social Survey had 20, but that was largely because the national surveys all brought in and became the national nodes. So that was a slightly different model. Daria, when we launched in 2014 as an ERIC, we had 15 founding members, plus two who joined just after the paperwork was done. So we, only, we basically had 17 founding members. And we have 12 more that are currently working towards a proposal to join. Now, that sounds like, well, why don't they just join? But remember how I said it has to be your national ministry that signs on. And in a lot of cases, the national ministries don't see the value. In some cases, we have to wait for a government change. And in some cases, we have to wait for a process. So Sweden, for example, is very keen. They're like, we're there. We're ready. We want to be a member. And so they went to the ministry, and the ministry said, we will be having a road mapping exercise in the autumn of 2019. Come back to us then. And the Swedes were like, no, we want to be in now. We'll pay. We don't want the government to pay the membership fee. We'll pay it ourselves. And the ministry said, we don't know what to do with that. Come back in 2019. So again, we have these challenges of making sure. But it is important that it is a durable, that it is a national commitment that there is really a sense that this is something that is a part of the national infrastructure, that there is a national node. So we have to be, uh, we have to be patient in Daria. 
So how do we manage this? With a very large group, lots of disciplines, lots of potential things we could do, and lots of different um, countries coming together with national strengths, all putting in kind in. It's a, very, it's a very strange kind of thing to bring together. So we do have a hierarchy. It's not that we're completely without a hierarchy. So we do have board of directors. I'm one of three. We have senior management team, professionals who make sure that everything runs and actually make sure the various groups are well um, coordinated. We also have a staff who make sure that we do communicate properly, that our finances are in order, all of that. And all of the people in this structure report into the General Assembly. The General Assembly is the group of those countries. So we get them all together once a year and they sort of look askance at each other um, and, and ask questions sometimes if we're lucky. And the General Assembly gets advice from a scientific board and they feed into these national organizations. So that's where the researchers are really are. So that's, there'll be a, a national coordinator who has a relationship with that person in the ministry and they will have a very complementary set of, of, of a kind of things that they do together. So the ministry is happy that digital scholarship is safe in the humanities in their country and the national coordinator is happy because they have some money in order to facilitate digital research, to bring people together in, in the national level. However, this isn't all we have. We also have that. That is the marketplace aspect. Because the national coordinators all meet together and they feed their knowledge in of what's going on on the ground in Poland, in Portugal, in Germany. And they feed it into these virtual competency centers where we have two people on each of four topics. And then we also have funded projects. And then we also have working groups. So all of this information is getting brought up, shared, developed, new thoughts being thought, new ideas coming together, things getting verified, things getting tried, things getting passed from country to country. This is the knowledge, this is the souk. You know, this is the kind of the place where people haggle over, well, you know, should we use TEI for that or should we use something else? Um, and it works very well. So let me tell you a little bit about some of these bodies. Um, let me lose my pointer again. Come here, come here, come back, come back. I always forget them. Okay. So first of all, the virtual competency centers um, or virtual competence centers. Um, really, what I consider these is this is quality assessment. So if we're going to have in-kind contributions coming in, or if we're going to have working groups forming, I'll tell you about working groups in a second, we need somebody to say, yes, that is something that is worth doing. Yes, that is something that is worth sharing. Yes, that is something that is worth putting back out again. Or that is actually something that is fantastic, but can we support them to put an English language interface on it? Can we support them to add a translation? Can we support them to have training materials? So that all comes through this quality assurance filter. And that's really what the virtual competency centers are. They program our annual meeting where everybody gets together. They help us when we're giving funding out. It really has quite a wide range of, of tasks. And they cover these four areas. Not because they're the only four areas, but because they seem to group together the kinds of things that we do. E-infrastructure, research and education, scholarly content management, and advocacy impact and outreach. To my mind, they're actually almost not so much about the activities we have, but the audiences we have. E-infrastructure is where all the computer science types want to be. They're the ones who want to build federated uh, identity and single sign-on. And we ask VCC1 to tell us, are, is that okay? Are they doing that well? Are they taking into account best practice? And because they're experts in that area, they say, yep, or no. Research and education. This is where the humanities scholars all end up. This is where all the working groups that have, are being led by that idea of a research question from the humanities or a desire to share research in the humanities tend to end up. Scholarly content management, museums, libraries, and archives. This is the data. This is where the collections go in. And finally, advocacy, impact, and outreach. This is where the policy face is. So this is actually probably the favorite working group of our national representatives. So all of these come together, and that allows us to really validate a lot of the activity that goes on under, under our, our auspices. And then we have the projects. Now, when you're running something for the long term, project funding is a blessing and a curse because it allows you to start something, to build something, and you're really doing lots of stuff, and then end of the project comes and you have no money left. 
So we have to use project funding in a particular way. Sometimes we merely support projects that are going on. Sometimes we work with other organizations like Clarin. We work very closely with Clarin, even though it might be strange to think of us as being in competition, but we're not, actually. They're different communities. There's a lot we can do together. And then we have projects like Humanities at Scale, which was just reviewed uh, early this year. It finished up. And through that, we were able to test a lot of programs, kind of interaction programs that we wanted to have. So we have a new online system for validating the uh, in-kind contributions. We have, um, we've had Daria ambassadors going out under Humanities at Scale. A lot of different things that we said, we need to know if these things are going to work. So we test them on the soft funding, on the project funding, and then we either mainline them or we let them, we let them stop as programs. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about uh, Parthenos, which you see down in the corner there, because Parthenos has been interesting as a cluster of arts humanities infrastructures. So we're partners, Claren is a partner, um, and IRIS, which is the um, research infrastructure still in its preparatory phase, not an ERIC yet, for heritage science. So really more of the sort of like the scientific measuring of manuscripts. Um, and again, we're all in this cluster together to see, well, what can we share? What can we learn from each other? What can we do together? Um, and there's good reasons why we need to do that. So having that marketplace, having this information level, this almost kind of chaotic side to Daria, and we have been accused of being chaotic, but what the chaos does is make sure that there are doors and windows and pipelines and archways through which information, through which connections, through which tools and services can pass, be validated, and be reused. Because that doesn't happen because you put it on a website. So it allows there to be a shared vision, which is what the kind of the hierarchy sets. But believe me, everything I'm doing in terms of the strategic plan, I am drawing out of that marketplace. I am listening, and I'm just writing it down. Um, and that's what we're feeding back. And that is what we will be about, um, or at least what we'll say we're about. It's what we already are about. Um, it's about flexibility and foresight. It's about open science. It's about the things that we can do um, in this way. Um, it is about um, empowerment of local nodes, the, 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 the collective of the independent decision makers. So the national nodes will do different things. Daria Germany doesn't do the same things as Daria Ireland. We're just in different places. We just have different access, but we need different things. But Daria EU benefits from having both of these approaches under its umbrella. Um, it harnesses this kind of collective intelligence. Again, the, there, is a, there is a certain ability to, to be checking knowledge as you go along when you have a big and diverse group that is talking to each other in this way. And it also creates this thing called a transactive memory system, which harnesses the specialization, harnesses the credibility, and harnesses the coordination. So that's how we, how we use this marketplace. Um, but the marketplace isn't just how we organize ourselves. And this is what I think is interesting. It's also, it is our strategy. And it is how we provide a service. So what we're moving now is we've kind of looked at how we organize ourselves and say, okay, how do we actually function to deliver according to that? And this is really, you know, for years we were suffering from having people say, well, I don't understand what Daria does. Can you explain to me what Daria really is, what Daria actually does? We said, well, you know, it's very, again, we would go back to the elephant and say, well, it's kind of like a tree, it's kind of like a rope, it's kind of like a hose. And people would say, yeah, they have no idea what they're doing. So after this process of strategic planning was well advanced, we had this moment where we said, well, we do four things. And we sat there in the room and we're like, oh my god, we do four things. So what are the four things we do? Well, marketplace for tools, services, quality assured, data, all of that is one. Um, the working groups is another. They're part of the marketplace in the organizational sense, but they're also part of the marketplace in terms of what we can offer. We do training, professional development for all career stages, and we do policy and foresight work. I'm going to talk just a little bit about these so you get a sense of what I mean. So the marketplace. The marketplace is probably the most important thing we will do. There is a page on our website currently, but it's not the real marketplace. The real marketplace, we're currently, again, looking for project-based funding to deliver this in a big way because it is something that needs to be built. We can maintain it but we don't want to build it on our national memberships. It would take everything else over because it's ambitious. 
We want to be able to share tools, share services, share data, but also improve upon the existing models. A list is not enough. We want to contribute to the democratization of digital approaches. It shouldn't be the case that if you want to do a digital project, you have to have a multi-million euro grant. It shouldn't be. You shouldn't have to have a grant at all. You should be able to access the tools, the resources, the knowledge you need through an infrastructure. It is, will create visibility and promote that reuse and sustainability. Remember I was talking about these national contributions that come in. Well, if they're really good, people should know about them. And sometimes they don't. So this is how we can promote that. And also, it's our way of tailing a response to the European Open Science Cloud, um, which I'll talk about in a second, so I won't go on about it right now. So there are directories, there are portals, there are registries, there are lists of digital tools. You've probably seen them. Bamboo Dirt is one. But it's just a list. And it doesn't really give enough context. So what we're hoping to do, so first of all, what, what a lot of these lists don't have is they don't have a community basis. We can improve upon that because we have the national in kinds. So we have that pipeline coming from a national verification and a national sustainability down into, we can spread it out to the EU. So that's one thing we know we can improve upon. They don't necessarily have quality control. Bamboo Dirt, as far as I can see, just puts anything up there. You say you want to be on there, you can be on there. We have our Joint Research Committee. We have our VCCs. We have that Virtual Competency Center structure that can allow us to do quality control and quality assessment and go back to people who've deposited things that we think could use just that little bit more to be useful to the community and push forward things that we think are, are kind of marketplace ready. It doesn't have any context. Um, when you think about an app store or like looking, looking for things on Amazon, you always find the verifiable information at the top, title, author, ISBN. Then at the bottom you find reviews, people who bought this also bought, you know, all that kind of stuff is down below, below the fold. And we think that that is another thing that we can do because we are the community. So we can say, have you used this? And people can say, yeah, I've used it. Look here. And you can see what it looks like when it's used. Or is there training material? Yeah, look here. There's some training. There was a summer school and they talked about it. So there's a video. So we can actually tie all that together in a different way because we've got the people working with us. When I say people working with us, I did a count. People keep asking, how many users does Daria have? And we don't know. The answer is, we have no idea. There are hundreds of thousands of humanists in Europe. How many of them actually tie in to their local networks? How many of the um, contacts they have with their local networks are actually about Daria? How many uh, of the benefits they get are tied into their local coordinators actually having a connection with Daria? It's really hard to say. But I can say we have a thousand people who are actively involved in building. That's pretty big. So if every one of those people is you know, in contact with two more, you know, you're growing pretty fast. So we do have the community, and we can build in the context. And finally, things like this don't have a reuse imperative. We will, and this is where the European Open Science Cloud becomes important for us. Now, my colleague, my fellow director, Frank Fisher, was asked to give a sort of a keynote last November about what the Daria marketplace was. And he, he likes to call it an app store for the humanities. We have to always do the quotes because we don't want Apple coming and taking us away. Um, and I love the way Frank described this. You know, there's no place I could go to recommend for fellow researchers where they should go to look for digital tools or services developed and carved out for the humanities. Not things we're borrowing from somewhere else, but things that actually have a sensitivity to our epistemic processes and cultures built into them. Well, of course, Google will help you if you know what you want, that is. But having a central place with tools and services for the humanities, which is community-driven, where you can find solutions, would be a benefit. And surveys have shown there's a strong demand for it in the field. A place where you can also count on serendipities, where you can find things you weren't even looking for. This is when the Daria Marketplace comes into play. The Daria Marketplace is planned as a central, easy entry place where humanists can find support for the digital aspects of their research. Think of it like a library, but with digital solutions instead of physical books. It will address all humanists, not just those who would regard themselves as digital humanists. It will contain a collection of software, tools, services, data sets, publication repositories, and learning and training material, and will establish visibility for them. That's what we're going to build. That's what we think our community needs as a place to share tools and services. But there's another layer to it. Woo! There's another layer to it when your slides jump around. And that other layer is the European Open Science Cloud. Now, you've probably not necessarily heard of the Open Science Cloud. Has anybody heard of the Open Science Cloud? Any Open Science Cloud groupies? Okay. So, if you need something to worry about, 
put this on your list. But it's okay, because Daria will help you. The Open Science Cloud is going to be, in theory, this place where all European researchers will put their data. And then, Carlos Moidas, who actually I quite like, he gets research, but I don't think he gets how research is done. He calls it the most exciting and ground, the place that he says that interdisciplinary research is the most exciting and groundbreaking, where the most exciting and groundbreaking innovations are happening here at the intersection of disciplines. And he thinks the way that we will have more and better interdisciplinary research is if people have access to more and better data. Europe already has a mandate for open access to publications. So if you're funded by the European Commission, you have to, within, for humanists, 12 months of a publication, you have to make it openly available. Preprint, postprint, APC, however you want to do that. Now, I like the vision, but I have some problems with it. First of all, humanists, we can't always share our data. If you go into an archive and you take pictures, maybe you've already signed your life away. Maybe you've already paid 30 euros a page. Maybe you just don't know. But we share ownership of our data in a way that other disciplines don't. Nobody's talking about that except me. We also don't use our data the way other disciplines do. I love it when I said, oh yeah, I, I had asked all the questions I needed to ask of that data, so I just threw it away. Can you imagine that? <laughs> you've got a historical collection. You're like, that's all we can really ever learn about this historical collection. Pitch it. Not the value system, not the epistemic culture, not the way our disciplines work. Um, we don't always recognize our sources as data. Um, and I'll, I'll come to that in a second, but the biggest, biggest question for me is, we're not set up to ask interdisciplinary questions. We are trained in a discipline. We are hired to work in a discipline. Our journals are based on disciplines. Our tenure track is based on discipline. There is such a disciplinary bias in the science system that we have now that to suddenly say, oh yes, people will just figure interdisciplinary out, it'll be great. It's very naive. But politicians, I suppose, can do that. And then he leaves us to figure it out. Now I did say that I felt that a lot of humanists don't even recognize their data as data, this data that we're being asked to share with everybody openly. And I've just finished a project um, where we did interviews with researchers working in big data. And one of the problems we realized is not that we don't have data, and not that we resist data, and not that we somehow don't understand the word, but we just don't use it. We have better words. So we talk about primary sources, secondary sources, theoretical material, reference work, databases, notes, annotations. We actually have a very fine-grained way of talking about the inputs into our, our knowledge processes, into our research processes. Every word that I list here, from a historian's point of view, is usually called data by a computer scientist. We found one article which was 21 pages long and used the word data over 500 times because they were using it to mean basically everything. I dated the data and then I data, data, dated it. Um, that was only a slight parody of what was actually there. So until, until the European Commission starts recognizing that there are different kinds of data, there are different ways in which data is shared. There are different ways in which data is communicated. There are barriers in our very strong, multimodal, embodied processes that mean things just aren't always digital. Um, I think we're going to have trouble with the Open Science Cloud. But again, this is why we're moving forward and moving forward fast and hard with the Daria marketplace. Because if we can build it first and say, this is what works for us, lads. This is what works for the arts and humanities, let's do it this way for us, then hopefully there will be something other than oh, humanists just don't share, which is what you will have. And I have had people talk about data sharing in the humanities and say, well, the reason why humanists don't share data is because they're lazy and afraid. And there was a third thing. It's not because we're lazy and afraid. It's because we have processes that are not compatible with what's being expected. So that's another thing we're working on. So that's the Daria marketplace, and I think that is the one that everyone's looking at us to deliver. But the other three pillars are equally powerful to what we do and what we provide. And this one is almost, this one is easy, working groups. Working groups are like, are like weeds. I mean, they're like, I don't know, they're like, we never realized what a hunger there was for a place where researchers could, without having to apply for money, without having to kind of compete, 
without having to really make their case for their existence, have, a, have a, an umbrella that they could say, we are this, and we look at this together, and we're transnational, and we're diverse, and we're trying to figure out what this means. So it's a non-competitive, a non-time limited, lightweight transnational mechanism for, for people to organize themselves. Um, and it gives them a platform to work together on something that is new, and it gives us a chance to see what they're doing, what's going on, what's interesting. And this has really been fascinating. We had, I think, I can't remember when we had our first working groups. So it's not even five years now, I think. Well, no, because there was originally, there was an old legacy kind of working group, so there was a few out there already. And they've just ballooned. And we have the most fantastic and amazing suite of working groups. If you're interested in digital numismatics, we have a working group for you. If you're interested in NLP for, for the humanities, we have a working group in that. If you're interested in women writers, lost women writers, we have a working group for that. So it's really a fantastic place where you can find, you know, if you're interested in research impact, if you're interested in annotation, if you're interested in registries, training, everything, people come together and they say, we want to be a working group, and this is why. And we say, absolutely. And we actually bring these working groups together um, once a year at our annual meeting. Um, we facilitate them with meeting space. We don't fund the working groups much. In fact, before last year, we'd never given them any money. And still they kept coming. Because it is a powerful instrument. They meet at the DH conference. They meet at other conferences. And now we give them a little bit of money that they have to apply for. And sometimes they use that to do reports. They do that to build data sets that they need. They do use that to come to the annual meeting. And they have their meetings. And we talk to them. And they talk to each other. And it is fantastic. So if you're interested in anything, I highly recommend you take a look at the Daria Working Groups. Join one. They'd love to have you. Um, it's a great way of kind of meeting people. It's, uh, it's, it sounds like I'm kind of running a dating service here, but um, it is sometimes hard to find that one other person who's really interested in biographical data because maybe they're not in your institution, maybe they're not in your country, but you will find yourself in the Daria Working Groups. Next, policy and foresight. <sighs> Don't ever do policy. Do not ever get involved in policy work. Because one of the things I find about policy work is that you spend a lot of time defending three words that have to be in the statement. You spend your whole day. And not a lot of people should be spending their time that way. And the average researcher is pretty good about not doing this. The average researcher is not really looking at the policy level. So what is you know, way out there in the stratosphere, what is that going to mean for me? However, policy will potentially impact upon your work conditions at some point. It will trickle down at some point. As I mentioned, if you ever get funding from the European, the, the European Commission, you will be obliged to make your, your publications open access. So don't publish in that journal that doesn't allow preprints. Or if the research data, if the European Open Science Cloud goes forward, you may be required to think about how to deposit and share your data. Um, and saying I don't have any may not be enough. So, and one of the things we find is that because there is the strong sense that the digital has an economic value, it has innovation potential, everybody has a digital policy, everybody has a digital strategy, this is a place where the policy tends to be quite pronounced and where a bit of foresight can really pay off. So this is the third of our kind of important pillars, the thing that we do so you don't have to, um, and that we try and make sure, first of all, that your voice is heard, also, that you hear what's going on so that we can promote that back out. So things like open science policy. This, this is the open science policy platform. This is what I do for fun. I hang out with these guys. Um, that's Commissioner Moydash in the middle there in the gray suit with his hands like this next to the guy with the amazing mustache. Um, so the things that we talk about, if you think about it, do you publish openly? Do you? Do you put preprints into a repository? Do you put postprints into a repository? Do you pay an APC to make sure that the journal you put it in makes your work open? And are there barriers? Well, sometimes there are. We tend not to do funded research, so we tend not to have the money for APCs, these author, um, author payments, in order to make something open. Um, a lot of other disciplines don't even imagine that there might be people out there who don't have sloshing, money sloshing around in their lab to pay the APCs or their postdocs. We generally don't. Do you deposit and share your data? Again, I've already mentioned, data is problematic. How does your work look according to next generation metrics? 
we've had to stop calling them altmetrics because somebody has already trademarked the term altmetrics. You may have seen the little donut. But I mean, do you think about what it means to have a Twitter feed or not have a Twitter feed? I really should have a Twitter feed, but I don't. Um, but I really should, actually, because a lot of these next generation metrics are looking at things like Twitter. Very strange to have your, your scholarship judged by Twitter, but there you go. Um, can you access training if you want to learn about these things? Do you know where to go? And if you do learn about these things, will you be able to use them? Because I still have plenty of colleagues who will say, I think that it's better to have good scholarship than open scholarship. It's like, no, they're not, no, they're not different. And open scholarship is important for a lot of reasons. So the good news and bad news. I always say this is the good news, bad news statement. Um, of all these people here, I'm the one humanist. I'm the one humanist in the room, and I keep saying the same things. I'm fighting your corner, and I'm there, and I don't shut up. The bad news is, I'm the only humanist in the room, and I keep saying the same things, and I'm not getting anywhere. So again, this is why policy is both frustrating and important. But Daria is more than me. And again, just continuing on this example of open science, because where we're pushing now, we have just hired a wonderful open science officer, Erspet Toshifra. And she is working to make sure that the things that we think should be in place to make this openness a reality and a possibility for the humanities are there. So ways to promote the humanities and open science policy, but also the ways to promote open science and the humanities, both things, both ways. So for instance, we're talking about a data reuse charter. How can we make it so that the people you get your research from, your research data from, the manuscripts, the publishers that, are, who, that have the literary data, how can we make it so that it is at least easy to see whether or not you can share that and how, under what conditions? We think that that's important. An open access publication policy that is meaningful and relevant for humanists. Because you read these policies and they first, you know, the first paragraph they're going into green versus gold versus hybrid and you glaze over and you go to sleep. Um, we need something that actually fits the way we think of our research, the way we think of our research now so that we can actually have that interface between the expectations up here and how we want to do our work. Remember that whole below the level of the work? Well, some of this means actually we get between the work and the people who want to tell you how to do your work. Um, we have a lot of projects that we work with on this. Opera's is about open access. Um, Hermeos is for open access for books. Open Air is the big open access um, uh, uh, sort of infrastructural specific dedicated initiative. Uh, Foster. Um, there's an open science MOOC that's being developed. The European Open Science Cloud Hub, the oh, it's EGDF, it's the governance framework for the open science cloud, um, and the OSPP, my own organization. Um, we keep in touch with them, again, so you don't have to. And when we see a problem, we flag it. And then when we see something developing, we communicate it. And finally, we're also looking to develop some citizen science training materials. Citizen science is a part of open science. Um, but it tends to happen haphazardly. And a lot of the examples that you see in open science training materials are all about counting, counting flowers, counting birds, you know, letting, you know, doing protein, protein folding in the cycle time when your computer is down. But it's different uh, in the humanities. And there's lots of good examples. And I think we do it almost naturally. Um, so bringing that out more is important. And then finally, <clears throat> training, education, skills, and careers. I'm going to linger a little bit on this one because this is the one I think you might find most interesting for where you are. If you're at a summer school, you're interested in training. Um, and we think infrastructures have a different way to, um, to uh, kind of come into this whole question of training and education because we're not a university, nor will we ever be. But we also create knowledge in a different way than in a university. Uh, and this is what uh, Jeffrey Rockwell calls acculturation. We have a very strong culture. We do a lot of applied work. We build, we create, and that's sort of the way that we navigate our place. Um, so we have this sort of um, acculturation approach, and we also have training and skills development, but again, it's different. We have internships, we have access fellowships, so we have things that are sometimes actually not relevant or, or that, are, that are good for not just early stage researchers, but also people who are just kind of coming into maybe a new stage of their career or just have discovered the digital and they want to be able to push their project forward. We have a lot more uh, different sorts of things like this. And we also, interestingly enough, are where a lot of people are going for their jobs. A lot of people are working for us in Daria that we see these are these fantastic researchers. They've gone, they've done the PhD, 
And then they come and they work through Daria. So again, there's a way in which we need to view our place in the, on the, um, in the, the whole ecosystem a little bit differently because of that. Now, as I said, I think infrastructure is creating knowledge differently. And one of the things actually we're doing is we're not competing with the university. So this is, again, if you're ever interested to see what's going on in Europe in terms of digital humanities courses, we built a course registry. We did this with Claren because we thought it was important that people could see what training was out there. And we realized there's a lot out there, but there's a lot, again, because they're run by universities, they're run by certain kinds of models. Um, then, not only are there models like that, but there's models like this, which would be similar to the summer schools in Leipzig, perhaps, and in Oxford. And there are online things like Daria Teach or the Programming Historian. So there's a lot of ways to develop skills. And we really kind of were wondering, okay, well, why is there all this skill training out there? Um, and, you know, on some level, my concern is that people feel like they need to be able to say on their CV, I do DH. This is, this is a few years old now, but the whole, the whole kind of fear factor, you know, DH is, you know, again, when I was doing my PhD, if you didn't have your theorist, if you couldn't, you know, do five minutes in the job interview on, you know, how you use Derrida or how you use René Girard, you weren't going to get the job. And now we have this concern that if you can't speak to digital methods, even if they're not relevant for your work, then you have, are, are going to run into trouble. So, um, I think actually, in the end, we have to be careful with these kinds of imperatives because, um, and I don't know if you know this book, but it's very interesting if you're interested in how people um, acquire digital skills. Because what Smiljana Antonievich says is that when it comes to senior scholars, results of our previous research show that humanists favor and best learn in practice when instruction closely follows their area of study and when it unfolds organically through collaboration with colleagues and students. And this absolutely maps what I've seen as well, and not just for senior scholars, for younger scholars as well. So where does that come from if really the model is that you go and you know, do a master's program, or do a summer school as an early career researcher? Where do we fill in the rest of the gaps? Because not every early career researcher is going to have access to this. And not everyone wants to go and do a master's degree after their PhD, which one of the people working for me currently actually did because she said, I need to be able to talk about this stuff, so I'm going to go do another degree. God help her. She's a patient woman. So, what we as infrastructures expect? Well, we think the role of infrastructures is going to continue to rise and become more important as a place for building skills. We think this in part because we see the hierarchies for knowledge creation shifting anyway. Again, I mentioned citizen science already. Citizen science is a really interesting move for you to be promoting this because it's all of a sudden saying, yeah, all that kind of research excellence stuff, you know, all that kind of being the best and being so good, no one can understand you. Not good enough anymore. So there's already this shift happening. And we think that there's, there's going to be um, opportunities there. Also, the move towards problem or mission-based research. Under Horizon Europe, this next funding program, we're all going to be expected to be able to say how our research fits in with the sustainable development goals. So if your historical research or literary research contributes to clean oceans, you're there. Um, but it does mean that there's this kind of applied aspect that's going to become more important. Um, the new career paths, as I mentioned already, for the research train, they are emerging. And also, the S3 roadmap continues to grow. Now, you all know what the S3 roadmap is, which is great. They keep updating it since 2006. And what happens is, so you get on the roadmap, and then you become a landmark, and you kind of go off the roadmap, and you're a research infrastructure. But new people are always coming onto the roadmap. So eventually, we're going to have more research infrastructures than the ministries are going to be willing to fund. So what happens then? How do we actually have a sustainable set of research infrastructures? Um, and I think that making sure that we have a part in training the next generation, helping them move forward, helping them acquire this kind of cultural set of skills will be a part of that. So, what might prevent this from happening? Well, we don't give credentials. You can't say, well, I got a three-week, I don't know, experience, a certificate of experience of working with Daria. Um, and that's expected. So, we have to find ways of getting around that. And some of the things that work for us as training, like internships, are harder to validate. It's harder to say, right, you got your five ECTSs for doing an internship because you were showed up every day and made photocopies. I don't know. Also, it's not what we're always funded for. We're funded to support research. Some systems will see education and training as something over here. Research is the wonderful stuff. Training is the kind of, ah, uh, yeah. 
So we have to make sure we make that um, very clear. The fact that old cultures die hard and saying, well, you know, we can teach you how to do some stuff. They can teach you how to do some stuff. You know, you, who's more credible? Who has the long, the kind of, the, the traditional um, hat to wear? And then again, there's a lot of other pressures on us as well. We're being pressured to collaborate with industry, for example. And we're also facing this idea that at some point, infrastructure is going to have to fall out of the field if they keep coming in. There's only enough capacity to support so many of them. So what we've done in the Parthenos project, I mentioned Parthenos already. So this is this cluster where we're working together with two other sort of humanities-focused research infrastructures. And one of the things we decided we would do is create a set of open educational resources. These are not in a Moodle. They're not a MOOC. They're just out there for people who either want to learn or, more importantly, for people who want to teach DH and want to draw in a perspective that might be slightly beyond their own. So we have a few. Um, we have an introduction to research infrastructures. So if you don't know what a research infrastructure is, so you all don't need to do this now. Although the movies with the Legos are kind of cool. So I highly recommend the movie with the Lego. Um, but uh, to find out, and again, some of the stuff I've been talking about today, but some other stuff about um, standards and interoperability and sustainability, things like that. We also, though, try to d dig into some other things. So for example, we realized, all right, well, we know a lot about managing these projects because you manage a small project in a small kind of um, environment, you will learn some things. We're managing a huge number of projects under this infrastructural umbrella. And we're working with a lot of projects. So we have a lot of knowledge about that. So we have a kind of a project management boot camp, which is actually specifically tuned towards digital research projects in the humanities. Um, and specifically, we look at things like disseminating and communicating. We look at creating impact. We look at recruiting user input and how you validate that. And we're also looking at this sustainability question. How do you make sure that what you're building is going to live on after your funding ends? Um, we also found one of the things that people said to us is like, is that um, can you do a training thing so that computer scientists will listen to me? <laughs> Sorry. I apologize to any computer, computer scientists in the world, in, in the room. Um, but um, we realized that collaboration, again, at a certain scale, collaboration becomes more important. And knowing how to collaborate across these disciplinary boundaries is hard. And it's not obvious. Because again, if I say data, then a computer scientist is going to mean something else than I mean. And we're not going to communicate unless we know what's going on. So it's really about trying to understand the epistemic cultures that come together. And we have two units in that. One is about museums, libraries, and archives. So this whole question about what is the impact of this Panizzi von Ranka, you know, 19th century war that's still going on. And another one is about um, how to collaborate with computer scientists. And we actually have, um, we did that on the base of some research. That's myself and my colleague, Owen. He's the other co-director of my research center in Trinity. Um, and he's a computer scientist. And, you know, basically, we've been working so, together so long now, we're kind of, you know, work husband, work wife at this point. So what we did was we both kind of subjected ourselves to the same set of questions just to kind of expose where that collaboration could break down and what that would look like. So it's an interesting exercise if you're ever interested in these kinds of issues. Um, and then moving on, um, drawing out some of the things that the Parthenos partners have brought in. Um, once you realize you have data, then you're going to need to figure out how to manage it. Um, and this is the one that kind of will give you a light-handed introduction to these FAIR principles, that data should be findable accessible, interoperable, and reusable, um, different ways you can do that, how to do a data management plan. You may never have had to do one. You may never have to do one. But my sense is you all look young enough that probably in the next 10 years, if you stay largely where you are, you're probably going to have to do a data management plan. So this is the kind of thing that can help you with that. Ethics, um, there's a lot of new information about ethics, what you can and can't do with data. GDPR is a part of that. Um, data quality assessment, open data, um, and also research infrastructures and data policy. Um, we're also grasping the nettle of CDOC CRM and formal ontologies. And this is great, actually. This one isn't quite finished yet because I know my researcher is in Crete this weekend, or this week, actually, doing the filming for it. Um, but it really was, she basically said, I can't do a training thing on CDOC CRM because I don't understand it and I don't know anything about it. I said, well, that's great, though. Sit in the room with the guy who does understand it, and Martin Durer is part of the, the project, and don't come out until you understand it. 
So this really is our attempt to actually have something that can make these sorts of formal ontologies that you can use to structure data more accessible, again, if it's relevant for you, if it's useful for you, if it's something that you're going to need and going to want. Uh, and then the last one, I think this one is really exciting because a lot of, most humanities research doesn't come from just one source. We use all sorts of different sources. And this is one of the big frustrations that I think the European Commission has with us, is that we can't just do research on data. We do research on data plus data plus data plus data plus data. And this one is paper, and this one is CD-ROM, and this one is a digital database, and this one is just text, and this one is written down on, I don't know, the back of an envelope, or the back of a napkin, because that great idea, actually I have seen this happen. In the Sindari project, we had a really good idea that actually did get sketched out at dinner on the napkin. So what is that? Is that data? It's data. Um, but there are some collections that are actually worth developing research collections around, or research questions around, that actually can sustain something as a freestanding um, source to query. And these are parliamentary records, newspaper collections, oral history archives, and social media. So this is going to be about how, okay, well, how would you ask a question and go about developing it in such a way that you could actually investigate it through these data sets? What would you add in? What kinds of tools would you use? And I think this is going to be very exciting, um, but that one is not quite ready yet. Um, I felt like I had to put this in there because I was just so happy when we got this. Um, you don't ever know. You, put, you create these things and put them out there. We haven't done a lot of, um, you will be doing much more promotion of these uh, next year. But somebody found them and somebody thought they were great and somebody gave them to their PhD student or, or somebody who was a, a, a master student who was looking to do a PhD and she loved it and she got her PhD position. So this is the kind of thing where I think, again, if you're looking for just that little bit of information, that thing that will allow you to understand, well, is this relevant for me? This is not relevant for me as a humanist. This is what we were trying to do in Parthenos. And this, for me, really says that we are managing to hit the sweet spot on that. And we also have other things. So again, there will be more webinars. Keep your eyes open for the webinars. We're looking at transnational access. This is something a lot of research infrastructures have to do, have fellows, move people from place to place. Even if you're building a virtual research infrastructure, you have to do this. European Commission has their ideas about things. Um, we're looking at how to actually do this embedding with formal university programs. Um, we've done a week-long uh, uh, summer school at the Leipzig Summer School, and we do presentations um, in some years as well. And we do workshops and presentations at com conferences such as DH Benelux, and I'm sure we'll all be out in force in Utrecht next year at DH. So we're quite busy. Um, so that's what I kind of want to tell you about Parthenos and also about training and education. And that sort of rounds off my definition by example of how in Daria we're really trying to fulfill this need to get below the level of the work, to support you know, the humanities at scale to the long tail of the researchers in a way that's, that's relevant for them. But you have to bear in mind that infrastructure is it's a power system. And there are dangers there. And so I just put this here because I think it's useful to flag that I know about it and also how we're trying to keep from letting this become unconscious biases for us as well. Um, you don't want to place research in the service to infrastructure. Again, you never want the tool to become, to, to kind of drag you along. The question has to come first, the research has to come first, and the tool has to follow. The infrastructure has to be below the level. Um, you also don't want to get aligned rhetorically with all of this discourse about you know, economic impact, innovation potential. It's important to flag it where it's relevant, but you don't, at the end of the day, want decisions about humanities research infrastructure to be made solely on the basis of impact into the cultural industries. It's there, but it's not the reason why we're here. So let's keep those apart. Um, first of all, it does create new professions. But once you start creating new professions, how do you manage them? How do you make sure that you don't end up really taking this very valuable knowledge base, this very well-trained set of people, and putting them into a situation where they're working on precarious contracts and, and all of that? Because a lot of what we do is on soft money. So do worry about how people are ending up, um, you know, if we're not going to end up sending people into the professoriate anymore. They're not going to have this job for life, going from assistant professor to associate professor to chair. Um, if they're going to instead be working on these really interesting projects and doing crazy things and using some of these skills and using some of that skills, well, let's make sure that we actually have career development in mind and it's not just you're going to be the junior research on this project forever. And finally, 
I think it does allow us to kind of work at scale. It does allow us to have a big network. It does allow us to have a certain kind of impact. But again, just like that first point, we can't let the impact drive the research. The research always has to be the first. We can provide new opportunities that might inspire research, and that's fine. But we don't want to say, you need to do this research because it's going to be high impact. Mm, that's not in and of itself a reason to do that. So this kind of brings me, and I suppose you would expect me to start my, pre my, my presentation with the Daria mission statement. Um, and mind you, this is preliminary. This is not actually set in stone yet. So you're getting the preview of the mission statement. Um, because we have a mission statement and we all hate it. And we sit around and we say, why are we using that word? We're not, we're not a platform. It's a terrible word. It sounds like this. And why are we using that word? We don't do that. That's a terrible word. Why do we say that? You know, so it's great. You know, we really bond over this. We all feel, you know, like we love each other when we tear apart our mission statement. But we need something that actually can get over this problem. People saying, I don't know what Daria does. So we've been working on this for a while. And we've realized that what we want to do, what we aim to do, our real mission is, first of all, to connect the arts and humanities. There is a fragmentation and a distribution. There are different cultures within the arts and humanities. And we don't want to change that. We just want to make it possible to connect. We want to be the translator between those disciplines. We want to be the, the person who in, makes introductions from Finland to Cyprus. That connective aspect is something that we can do, and we can do, I think, uniquely, without actually changing the good work that goes on, but actually providing another layer. That's infrastructure. We're complementary. Again, what we do is different. So we can fit into the spaces in between, and that's not a failure. That is a great strength. That means that we create a stronger basis because we have arts and humanities in the research institutes, in the centers, in the universities doing what they do, and we can enhance that. And the creator, this actually came from um, a very strange sort of exercise we did with a branding consultant who said, um, you know, there's these different Jungian archetypes. You can be an explorer or you can be a creator. And we said, no, 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 no. The humanists and the, the arts researchers, they're the explorers. They do the basic research. They just go out and chase the question. We're the creators. We want to create the level. We want to create, we want to build stuff. We want to be the engineers. We want to build the stuff that they can use. Not that we're not explorers, not that we're not interested, not that we're not always seeking to do that better, but we want to have that applied dimension that they may not want. And that differentiates us as well, and that again makes a strong ecosystem. But the most important thing that came out for us in this discussion with this branding agency and it was really interesting when the, um, the consultant said to us, he said, well, you know, you realize you're not about the digital. We said, no, 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 we're a digital research infrastructure. He said, no, no, no. Because every person here is passionate about the humanities. And the digital is a means to an end. The digital is a part of where your community is. And it's a part that they're sort of struggling with. Because there's this fast-moving technology. It's changing. You know, there's a new version and there's a new software that you have to use, and there's a new language you're supposed to use. And you actually are trying to protect the arts and humanities and make it possible for them to access that, but also make it possible that the expectations coming from that engineered sociality are not actually changing what they do. So really, we're connecting, we're complementing, we're connecting, but it's always for the arts and humanities. It's coming back to that. And we think that that's a really powerful message. So on that powerful message, I have nothing on this slide. There was something on this slide at some point. But all it was, let's see if it's next one. There you go. All it is is a logo. And a thanks to you all for listening. I'd be very happy to take any questions you have. I've left some time. Um, so um, fire away. Uh, any question? Uh, OK. Sorry. So thanks, Jennifer. It was very interesting. And I like very much this kind of talks in which someone comes and, and tell us how Daria works, because sometimes it's difficult to understand this from the outside. <laughs> I have a question about infrastructures. I'm a scholar from the south, from the global south. I work a lot also with scholars from North America and with Europe too. But what I say is that sometimes infrastructures are not the same mm -hmm. in these three places. How Daria, as, as a kind of European infrastructure, is envisioning these kind of problems? Because 
what I tend to see is that we are sometimes speaking as infrastructures, but they are different, mm. very different. And this is a problem for the digital humanities because in the digital humanities we talk about collaboration, global work, co-creation. Mm -hmm. So how can we put <coughs> everything together in some kind of neutral, open science, digital humanities? How yep. do you see this? Yep. Um, it's a great question. And uh, I remember um, once being said, well, why are you not working with the, you know, with the Mellon Foundation on this? And I was, well, we can't. We're European. We're a European body, you know, we have to serve Europe. We are paid for by Europe and we have to serve Europe. So I think there's not a good way for us to avoid the, um, I want to say the, the biases of being European. You know, we, have to, we, have to, we have to build according to what our members have. That said, first of all, we're very globally aware. Um, now, again, not necessarily globally, south globally aware, um, but one of the things that our DESIR project is doing right now in the next few months is we're actually running workshops in the US, in Australia, and in two other places I can't remember. Um, so again, we're trying to actually do a sort of a validation phase to see, well, what, what does Daria look like from outside? Um, and that I think is useful. But the other thing that I think is really important, first of all, infrastructure is different in different places. Different places will have different needs. Different places are different levels. This is what we see from having the national members. Um, and again, you know, Ireland learned a lot from Germany in the beginning because Germany was so well set up. Now, other countries are learning from us. Sweden is learning a lot from Ireland. So there is a sense of you can have different models that are compatible with learning from one place. But the most important thing I would say to you is our members and this is really, this messes with the heads of a lot of people. Um, our members make decisions and determine the strategy of the organization. So the General Assembly will validate our strategy. Um, and so only those national members will be able to say, yes, that's the strategy. The national coordinators get together and they uh, contribute to that. And they, um, they, they are the ones who put the, um, the in-kind in. But once anything is in the Daria marketplace, once anything is a Daria asset, it is open. So we develop on a very open science model. Um, and again, we do get criticized, I don't want to say criticized, but we do get um, questions about this. Well, why on earth would I pay to be a Daria member if everything that you do is free? And it's, it means that you become a part of the conversation. You become a part of the formative network. And I think there's no avoiding that. But it does, at least we are very open and I think you know, we, we would be looking for ways to have a greater impact in places where we could. So it might be something that would be worth discussing about whether there is something in, we do, in what we do for Europe, in Europe, that would be useful elsewhere. Because we're very, we're very open to that. And potentially, um, the, our current uh, chair of our General Assembly is not very minded to bring us international. But maybe after we're really into the, the operational phase, and we will soon have a new chair of that organization, there might be more of a room to be more international. And that, so that's something that could be on the horizon. Thank you. Any more questions? Any more questions? Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, thank you. I was just wondering, uh, I haven't taken only a very superficial look at the Daria website. It's at, it looks like a perfect idea in terms of bringing people who are interested in the same instruments together. Mm -hmm. The problem for somebody like me who is very new to this world is that I might know what question I want answered, but I do not know how to answer it. Mm -hmm. And uh, just looking at the, 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 the platform that you have, it seems like, yes, you're connecting people who already have a certain level of awareness mm -hmm. of how the questions have to be phrased and how they have to be answered. And I was wondering if there's any way you envision in breaching that divide, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe a kind of a service where you write a question and somebody who actually knows something says, ah, this is what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, that is kind of a lot of the thinking behind some of the introductory level stuff that we did through Parthenos. It's because we felt that there, you know, people really needed to know what does a research infrastructure do? And why would I ever look at them? Um, and there are certain things that actually, you know, we're not going to answer. Um, certain things you'd be better off, well, actually, Daria Teach is, is a Daria thing as well. So, um, and that's much more about methods and skills and less about actually infrastructural development. 
<clears throat> um, so I guess part of it is that you know we're trying to kind of push out and make it available. But also remember, we are a membership organization. So, and again, this is one of the sort of differentiators between the members and the non-members. Um, there is this reciprocal relationship between the national Daria and the um, and the, the EU level. So actually, as Daria EU, I would probably not be very useful to you because we're all about building the infrastructure. What would be infra what would be hugely useful to you is your national Daria infrastructure because what the nationals do is they have national level tools, they have national level meetings, they have national level um, kind of uh, you know interactions. Um, we have thought about doing something like, what is it, the DH questions and answers or the, the, you know, those kinds of things. They exist. But what we find is that the depth of what people need is generally something that has, needs more meat. So either, you know, you can kind of find out how to ask the questions through Parthenos. You can kind of find out if there's a, an infrastructure project that has transnational access. You can just kind of go and say, okay, well, I want to work with something for a while, someone for a while. Um, there are summer schools. Again, we, we kind of try and throw it out there. But the idea of a bulletin board has never quite been something that we felt would really um, express the spirit of us. Again, that marketplace, that chaos, that kind of interaction, um, or that really would be a good use of our resources to try and monitor, because these things really take a long time to develop and a long time to bed themselves in. You go to Humanist first, because Humanist already has a network effect. So I'd say um, that, again, you know, looking at the working groups, looking at the, the, the Parthenos suite, looking at Daria Teach, looking at the infrastructure around us. And actually, our website is terrible at the moment. Um, it's, it's, it's better than it was a year ago, um, but we had a, um, uh, somebody who left the organization who, who kind of didn't quite finish that, and we're still digging out from that. Um, so I'm, I apologize for our website. But again, we try and kind of throw things out that seem meaningful and that are validated by our community. Um, that wouldn't be one that I think we'd go to too soon, um, but I think that there's probably a lot of other things out there you might look into. Or you can email me. <laughs> I'll tell you where to go. Because that's the other thing about Daria. Again, it's a wonderful organization to work in. People are passionate. People are open. We all just want this digital humanities thing to work for everyone the way it works. Um, so I might be a Daria director, whatever that means, but I have no problem with somebody emailing me. Or you can email Daria info, or you can email anyone else you know. Um, again, we're not going to look at your, at your national membership. We're not going to, but we'll hopefully find somebody to send you to. Very well. I have to say that we are trying to join to, to Daria, but uh, we are, as I said before, uh, we have uh, to look for the new contacts in the, in the new government, so we are trying to, to do it. Meanwhile, can, we have at UNED, the Laboratorio de Innovación de Medias Digitales, this is a kind of Daria, uh, National Daria or Clarion Daria, because it's people who knows about uh, humanities and computer science and can help you if you need it. It's an advertisement. So, any question? Yeah, please. You have to, you have to use the microphone, please. Press the button. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have a, like a bit of a naive question, maybe. So I do research on um, transnational history, really, mm -hmm. which means that I basically, I would, if I understand you correctly, I would deal with different national Daria bodies. Is that like, because I'm, so I, I work on like um, newspaper collections and especially digitized <coughs> ones, right? Like, right. So I'm, what I've seen so far, they look like very different depending on which mm -hmm. national level you talk to. So I'm, yeah, I'm a little bit confused about that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what we're trying to do at a very meta level is to make it easier for, for example, collections to come together. <clears throat> now, Europeana has done a great job with the newspaper collections already. So that's, a, you know, that's one of these areas where actually you can look into them. Um, if you're not doing something like newspapers, um, and this is really um, the Sendari project was, was all about how can we support transnational history. And the answer is it's very hard. And it's not that you would deal with different national Darias, because the Darias are about supporting the researchers in the country and kind of taking them where they are in terms of skill, where, they, where the local infrastructure is. Um, what we would do, what we are doing, though, is things like the, um, <clears throat> the, 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 the kind of promotion of standards. 
And again, if we can, if we can assist the cultural heritage institutions to know that this is a researcher requirement to be able to do transnational history, then we can find ways of federating data. It's a lot harder than it looks, um, basically is what we found out, to kind of get, uh, to get Romanian data to talk to French data is nearly impossible. Um, so there's a long way to go, but this is where the level, the level that we work at is to say, well, there's all this data and people want to do transnational history. How can we make that easier? We'll never make it so that you don't have to go and look at the final record, the real records. I think that we'll never get there, nor should we. But what I would love to see us be able to do is for you to be able to see, you know, well, look, there's these records in Poland and these records in the Czech Republic and these records in Austria. And actually, from looking at this, I can also see that there's these records in Romanian. And actually, I think it's worth me learning basic Romanian so I can go and look at them. That's the kind of level that I think we can aspire to. Because I don't think we want to, I, I think that if we go further than that, we may go too far. We may take things out. You may need to be in that archive to do that. Um, so it's not about different national darias. It's about actually having a national support for transnational history. But what we are trying to do, if you're interested in that meta level of how can you make transnational history possible, what things are there, and we actually do have an application open for a second round of Sundari, which will be all about open science and all about opening history, um, then we may be able to kind of help the work to happen at that level, to put the policies in place, to put the awareness in place, to put the organizations um, to help support them to work in unified ways. You know, don't change your permanent identifiers every couple of years. This came out of the Erie Project, that you had organizations that were just kind of saying, ah, oh, we'll just throw out the catalog and start again. Ah. Um, so I think it's not so much looking at different Daria's, it's about looking at how Daria can actually help support and push forward the needs of researchers like yourself. Hmm. Yes. yes, please. Yeah, so um, earlier you talked about uh, interdisciplinarity and in infrastructure. And so I, was, I kept thinking about my own research where I do literary analysis, yeah. taking geographical data and uh, biological environmental data. Sure. And I was wondering how Daria would uh, sort of support that. So humanists are reaching out into data sets mm -hmm. from other disciplines that are not necessarily arts and humanities. We have a working group for that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> We have a, we have a newish working group on geo humanities, uh, geospatial humanities, uh, and that's exactly a group looking at these kinds of questions. And again, as I said, it's a relatively new group. Um, they formed recently, and I don't know exactly what disciplines are involved, but they are precisely interested in these questions of well, you know, how can how can geospatial data actually support the study of the humanities? And this is exactly the kind of community where you you go in, you'd learn some stuff. Maybe they'd be people you'd want to collaborate with. Maybe you'd kind of say, oh, gosh, not for me. But again, it is exactly the kind of thing that the working groups are doing. Mm. No more questions? No? Thank you very much, Jennifer, because uh, I think that you give us uh, a very nice and interesting big picture of what is our infrastructure and how important it is for the research uh, to, have, to know at least that uh, they are not alone in the world of, with the yeah. computer science people, yeah, I know. So thank you very much. Um, then we finished today. Uh, tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning, eh, ma mm, mañana a las 9, y, y ya está, y nos vemos mañana. Venga, gracias. Right. gracias.